part three of our lecture on post-classical Europe. So today what we're going to look at is primarily the Crusades and their impact on Europe. So starting around uh, 1096, we're going to see Europe is going to go through some pretty dramatic changes um, as the Crusades um, go for those 200 years to 1204. So in 1096, Pope Urban II called to recapture the Holy Land for Christians. And let's explain what that means. And so um, this is Christian Europe over here, um, Catholic. And over here, these are Muslim empires, right? We have lots of Muslims going on. We have um, the Abbasids. Um, and later on, we're going to have the Seljuk Turks and so forth and so on. Um, and so this was the Jerusalem and Bethlehem. These are places mentioned in the Christian Bible as the birthplace and life of Jesus. And so Pope Urban II was upset that they were in Muslim hands at this point, and they want them back in, in Christian hands. Um, and so he sends a call out, and he says, all Christians of Europe, um, I want you to go to the, the holy lands, the places mentioned in the Bible, and I want you to recapture them for Christendom. Um, and so we're going to see mostly French knights who are going to do this. And they're going, one, because they're inspired by their religious leader. Um, two, their religious leader promises them that if they die in, on this crusade, that they're going to go to heaven, that their sins will be absolved. Um, and plus, if they go to um, the, these Muslim empires and carve out Christian kingdoms, <clears throat> they'll be able to get new land. They'll be able to get titles. Excuse me. So a lot of these knights that go, they're second and third born sons, who if they stay in Europe because of what we call primogeniture laws, they won't be able to inherit anything. Um, and so this is a chance to actually get their own titles, their own lands, because their older brother is going to inherit everything back in Europe. Um, so if they go here, they might get their, they make their own land. And so we see um, hundreds of knights, they're going to travel down to um, these Muslim empires, and the First Crusade is you see the lands that they conquered in the First Crusades right here. And so these are now going to be under Christian hands. Now, um, eventually, Muslim armies will come back and recapture them. And so the next pope that um, will issue another crusade, and then that will be unsuccessful. And then another crusade, and that will be unsuccessful. And so by the Fourth Crusade, what happens is um, Christians will go down here. They're going to go by land. Um, and they're going to go, and they're trying to get to the Holy Land, um, over land instead of water, and they stop here um, in Constantinople. And that's in, Byzantine, that's in the Byzantine Empire's hands. And the Byzantine Empire, at this point, is weakening. Um, and so these, these Christian knights from Europe, they say, well, why are we going to go all the way down and fight these Muslims, who we've twice been unsuccessful with, if we can just stop here in Constantinople and just take over and, you know, sack and pillage and plunder this Christian kingdom here? Um, and so that's what they do. So they never really make it down to the Holy Lands in the Fourth Crusade. What they do is they just sack and destroy um, the Byzantines' capital of Constantinople, and then they go back to Europe, taking all their plunder with them. Um, and so that's the last really major crusade. The only one that was successful was the first one, and then it wasn't successful for even that long. So we have Christians constantly going down to the Middle East or Southwest Asia, having interactions with Muslims. And a lot of the times they're violent interactions, but some of the times, especially when they created these brief Christian kingdoms down here, not only are they trade, they're raiding Muslims, but they're also sometimes engaging in trade. And because of this, they're going to learn about all kinds of new things that the rest of your, your Asia has already found about, out about. Right? We've talked about the Silk Roads in previous lectures, and Muslims were tied into the Silk Roads. And so all of those things that we've talked about in previous lectures about languages and religions and goods and products and pathogens and all of those things, Europe is now going to get reconnected with because they've kind of gone out of their self-imposed isolation, their feudal isolation where there was not much trade, and they've reconnected because of this middle military conquest with the rest of Asia. And that's going to have a significant impact on Europe, right? So some of the things that they learn about as they're either conquering or trading with Muslims is they learn about all these spices that the Muslims are, that the Muslims are eating. And again, Muslims got these spices from Indian Ocean trade, down here, or Silk Road trade right here. Um, and so Europeans are like, oh my gosh, this is great. We never knew food could taste this good. And so they're going to bring those spices back to Europe. 
and Europeans are going to get a taste for these things. Now, these spices are super expensive because a lot of these spices were from India or far off Southeast Asia, and by the time they come through the maritime or over, overland trade routes, the price has been marked up and marked up and marked up by all these merchants, and so they're really expensive. But Europeans have a taste for them. They just can't get enough. I mean, imagine never having food that tastes like anything, and then you get, um, then you get cumin, and you get pepper, and you get nutmeg, and you get cloves, all of these spices, um, and you know you, you don't want to go back to plant the bland food. The other thing, the another significant thing that Europeans got a taste for, in a, in a matter of speaking, is um, silk. Right, coming along the Silk Road and Indian Ocean trade, we Muslims had access to silk, and so when Europeans saw this, they're like, "Oh my gosh, that's a lot better than our wool clothing." Um, it's a lot softer, it's a lot more vibrant and colorful, we really, really want it. But again, the problem was by the time silk came from East Asia all the way to Europe over the trade routes, it was super expensive. Um, and so there's lots of money to be made in um, getting in on this trade um, and trying to sell it to people in Europe. Right. Um, the next thing that the Europeans learn about as a result of the uh, Crusades is they're going to relearn some of their own past. So even though it's before this, this um, course begins, our course begins in 1200-ish, right? Um, we see that there was Greek, ancient Greek and Roman civilizations in Europe that had reached amazing heights. Um, and all of that learning, all of that Greek and Roman math and science and philosophy had all been lost to the Europeans for the most part. There were a few remnants of it in monasteries that they had preserved, and them being literate people, but for the most part Europeans had lost touch with their uh, classical past. And when they have interactions with Muslims here, well, the Muslims have been engaging with the Byzantine Empire, um, who has preserved some of that Greek and Roman learning. Um, and so Muslims knew about uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all of these things. Um, and so when the Europeans start engaging with Muslims because of the Crusades, they relearn re about their own past, about their own European heritage, and they bring that knowledge back to Europe. Right? So I had said, really, there's basically three places that they relearn about these things, and we'll talk about them in more detail in a few minutes. All right. Next, um, we also see Europeans learn about new uh, crops or new versions of crops. And so, of course, Asia is a big place, and they grow all kinds of different food that Europeans have not been exposed to. And one of them is a new kind of wheat. Um, and so we see from Africa and from Southwest Asia, um, Europeans, because of the Crusades and increased trade, they're going to learn about new versions of wheat that are able to grow faster and in drier climates. And so this allows Europeans to increase their own food production. They've had wheat before, but not this, this more hardy variety. Um, and so we're going to see more food in Europe as a result of this. Um, also, we've talked about this before, alfalfa is coming from Persia, or modern-day Iran, and that knowledge of that crop and how to plant it, um, and how to grow it, how to use it, is going to also make its way to Europe because of the Crusades. And we had said in the past that alfalfa is really good for horses, and so horses in Europe are going to get bigger and stronger um, and be able to carry the weight of the knights at this time, um, and so we're going to see that that's going to also impact European culture. Plus, people can eat alfalfa too, so here's another other crop that allows people to be um, more healthy as well. And then of course citrus fruits. So oranges originally come from East Asia and so these citrus fruits are going to make their way from east to west across the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean trade and people in India are going to start planting them and eating them and the people in Southwest Asia are going to start planting them and eating them and then the Europeans get exposed to them and they really like oranges because Europe is not a very, it does not have a tropical climate. Um, it has, if you're in Northern Europe, it has um, a very wet and cold climate. Um, if you're in Southern Europe, it has a Mediterranean climate, which means it's kind of like in America, Los Angeles. It's warm, but it's not all that wet. Um, and so it ha we don't really have a lot of citrus fruits that normally grow in Europe. And our bodies need citrus fruits. They need the vitamin C to be healthy. And so we're going to see Europeans have an insatiable hunger for these lemons and limes and, and oranges that are going to be coming from the rest of the world. Um, and so this is also going to make its way to Europe. Um, we can start to plant some of these citrus fruits in southern Europe, at least. Um, and so we see that the European diet grows and gets better and more varied, and we get more access to, to um, minerals that we need and, um, and, and all of that. And so the population of Europe 
Europe starts to really start to move up at this point. Um, and we're going to see that has a huge impact on Europe as a whole. All right. So as the population is increasing and as trade is starting to increase, if you remember, we talked about before the Crusades, there was very little trade in Europe because it was just too chaotic and too dangerous. And so most of the things that we had were made on manors. Um, but now that we've started to re-engage with Asia, that we've started to learn about all of these new things via the Crusades, we're going to see that trade starts to flourish because people say, oh my gosh, you can make a lot of money trading. In addition to that, we're going to see that, that kingdoms in Europe start to get more centralized. Um, we start to see not all of this regional little feudal kingdoms fighting each other, but over time we're starting to see the Kingdom of France emerge, and the Kingdom of England emerge, the Kingdom of Spain is starting to come together, um, and so these larger kingdoms are going to create more peace within their kingdoms. They're going to clamp down on some of this violence between knights and nobles, and so that peace is going to make trade safe. Right? And so since we have an incentive to trade, all of these new goods coming from Asia that we want, and also politically the situation has become more peaceful, um, we're going to see trade go up really rapidly. And when you see that, you have urbanization. So here's an example for the reason of growth of cities and urbanization, is there's more people, and so more people means more people in the city. We have a larger population, there's an incentive to trade because of the Crusades, and also we're going to see that it's just peaceful to trade now. So we're going to see the growth of cities. Prior to this time, Paris was was one of the biggest cities in Europe and it was only about 10,000 people. Um, and so when we talk about cities in Europe pre-Crusades, um, they were very small, but now they're going to start to rapidly grow. Um, and as we get more foods, right, and we get better techniques at growing food, um, we're going to see that we need less farmers. And so when we have less farmers in society, well, what else are they going to do? They're going to become artisans. They're going to start to make things. Um, and so we have a better quality of life. We have a better standard of living. We have more access to better food. And these artisans are going to congregate in cities because that's where most of the customers are. That's where they can have contact and get goods or trade their goods from far off other cities because we see markets, as you see in this picture, we see markets markets develop in cities. All right, now, if you're a noble in the feudal pyramid, you want a town to develop into a city in your, in your fief, your piece of land, because then you can tax all of that. Um, and so we see that these nobility wanted to encourage trade because they can tax the trade, right? And so they want to control the town. Um, however, the cities don't like this noble taxing them so much, controlling them so much. And so what they do is they write letters and they ask the, the far-off king, right, who is in the kingdom, they say, hey, can you take over the control of our city? Um, can, can, we, can we have you as our leader instead of this local noble who's right here controlling us? And the king is like, yeah, I want to be able to tax the trade there instead of this noble. Yeah, yeah, why not? Right? Now, why would the towns do this? Because a far-off king right, is less likely to mess with them and tax them as heavily as a local noble. Um, and so towns get what's called a charter. A charter means that they have special permission to kind of be outside the feudal pyramid. They no longer are controlled by the local nobility as part of his fief. Now they're kind of a separate entity that is, is like its own little political organization that does owe allegiance and pay taxes to the far-off king, but that's okay. He's so far away um, that in his castle that, you know, he's not going to know what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we can kind of run our own affairs and be kind of semi-autonomous. And so we see this happening all throughout Europe where these towns get these charters um, and they are kind of, they're kind of, we see the kind of the breakup of the feudal pyramid starting here because in the feudal pyramid, Pyramid, we didn't talk about towns and merchants at all. And so now we have this new kind of semi-autonomous entity, the town, that doesn't fit in the feudal pyramid. And so as we get closer and closer to 1400, 1450, which is the end of our time period here, we're going to see that the feudal pyramid is starting to break up because there are new things evolving that challenge its traditional um, pyramid structure, like chartered towns.
So let's give you an example of some of these towns. So urbanization is happening in Italy. And if you look, right, here is Europe over here. And so these people in Europe, they desperately want the silk and spices um, and trade goods that, it, that it, the Muslim world has access to because of the silk roads. And so look, lo and behold, between um, the Muslim world and these European customers, we have, and here's our trade route, right, con connecting the two, this Mediterranean trade route, we have Italy perfectly situated right in the middle to control kind of as the middleman between the Muslims who have all of these goods and the Europeans, the other fellow Europeans who want these goods. And so we see that these trade cities like Venice, Pisa, Genoa, um, Florence, Naples, all of these are going to be getting, um, they're going to grow in power, um, and so they're going to get away from the local nobility's control, and they're going to get charters, and they're going to become so powerful that eventually they can even get away from any king controlling them, and they become what we call city-states. And we've talked about city-states before in this time period. We've talked about the Swahili city-states. So here again we see Italian city-states. They are an entity onto themselves. Like Venice and Genoa and Florence and Pisa, they're not going to be controlled by a king. They're going to be controlled by a group of merchants and artisans that are kind of the leaders of their cities. Um, and so we have these city-states are definitely not in the feudal pyramid, um, and they're kind of these separate, very powerful, very wealthy entities because they're the middleman in these trades. Now, another group of city-states that we're going to see up here is the Hanseatic League. And so we, Hamburg is one of them, and Bremen is another one. These are city-states in northern Europe as opposed to southern Europe, and they're going to make their money also acting as a middleman, right? Up here... Um, this is very wet and very uh, a chilly climate up here. And so you don't grow a lot of uh, crops up in Northern Europe, but you can raise a lot of sheep. And so up here, these are going to be, a lot of wool is going to be created. And so these city-states as an act as a middleman as wool merchants between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. Right, so here are the middlemen here. Um, and so they're going to get so powerful, these cities, that at first they're going to get a charter to get away from the, the local nobles' control. And then they're going to get so powerful that some of them can even start to pull away from um, the local king's control. Um, and so we, again, we see these city-states emerging. All right, so let's look deeper into these cities. What is the, what is the labor system um, in these cities? Well, we had said that on the manor, we have two labor systems. We have peasant labor that own their own land, control their own lives, um, they're farmers, and then we have serf labor, which doesn't control any land at all, and almost everything that they make either goes to their local noble who controls the land or the church who gives them a tithe, right? They have to give 10% of their stuff to the church, so they're very poor. Now, if we go into the cities, though, we have a different labor system, right? The labor system we have here is an artisanal labor system. These are people that are skilled either, as you see in the top picture, cloth dyers, or you see in the middle picture, maybe they're a blacksmith um, or something like that. Um, and so if you want to become an artisan labor, you have to go through an education process because they didn't have schools public schools like um, like we have today. Um, and so what happens at the age of, I don't know, 7 to 10, your parents would say, we want something better for our son than what we can provide them. And so they pay some master craftsman who's up here, right? They pay a master craftsman to take on their son, and it usually is a boy, to be an apprentice. And so this apprentice will no longer live with his own parents. He'll go live with the master craftsman. And the master craftsman will have him, will start to train him in whatever trade he is. And at first, for the first few years, it's just sweeping up around the, around the shop. It's doing simple, basic things. Um, and then as he shows that he is more and more skilled and knows what he's doing, the apprentice will get a little bit more responsibility. He'll do simple things around the shop. He'll start to learn the craft. And then after several years, if he shows that he's competent and his parents keep paying the master craftsman, then he can graduate to be a journeyman. And a journeyman has a little bit more independence. Well, let's use a blacksmith as an example. So if you're a journeyman blacksmith, what happens is the master blacksmith will say, I think you've reached the point where I can trust you on your own now to do simple things like uh, make a horseshoe or you know, make a simple a hoe, or make some simple shears, or something that doesn't take a lot of skill that we can sell for pretty cheap and kind of try to produce a little bit more. 
And he does that for several years until he's really good at that. It's like, okay, let's, let's give you some more skill. And so we start to train him to do more complex things, right? Maybe we'll teach you how to do a sword, or maybe we'll teach you how to do a plow, um, those kind of things. And so he starts to gain more and more skill. And then eventually, if he's reached kind of the apex and the master craftsman can't teach him anymore, the master craftsman will say to his journeyman, okay, do something that's really hard and do it really well. Let's see what you got. And so what would happen is the journeyman, um, this is kind of the pinnacle of education, he would produce a masterwork. And that masterwork would be, you know, let's just say a sword. And that sword then would be produced and he would hand it to his master. And his master would look at it and it's like, I think this is really good. Um, I'm ready to, per to show it to the other masters in the town all the other blacksmiths in this case, and they'll all take a look at it, and if they all agree that it's really good, then this journeyman is no longer um, in training. Now he can join the ranks of the other masters and go ahead and start a business on his own. Um, and he can get his own apprentices and his own journeymans, and he can start to make his own money. Up to this point, either everything he made, all of the profits from that went to his master, or he only got to keep a small portion of it. And so now he can set himself up in business and go on his own. And so this is, this is how one becomes a skilled artisan in medieval Europe. Now, once he produces that masterwork and all the other masters have said, we agree it's good, he can apply to join the guild. Now, if you're in a city, the only way you can produce things on your own is if you, one, became a master craftsman, and two, you applied for and they accepted you as part of the guild. If you were a blacksmith in a town um, that was trying to make things and you're not in the blacksmith guild, they would run you out of town or they would throw you in jail or they would confiscate all of your goods and all of your profits. And so we see that the guilds really control production in towns, right? You had to be a part of the guild or at least be, um, be an apprentice or a journeyman under a master who's part of the guild to work in that town, right? So these guilds have a lot of power and especially when the town becomes um, a city-state or if it has its own charter, because these are the most powerful, wealthy people in the town. The master craftsmen, the artisans, and the merchants, they really control the town, because they control all the power. They control who can trade, who cannot trade, who can produce things, who can't produce things, who can sell things. All of these things are controlled by the guild. So let's take it in more in depth, right? So the guild will control membership. So if you want to be a blacksmith in the town, well, again, you have to pass your master work, and then the guild has to say if you can be in it. Now, the reason they do this is they don't want overproduction in the town. If we get too many silversmiths or blacksmiths or silk dyers or, uh, I'm sorry, wool dyers or whatever, um, not silk dyers, um, we see that then the price will go down. There's just too much and so the price will go down. And so the guild very much wants to control prices and they do that by controlling production and membership, right? We're going to limit production because that makes things scarcer and when we have things scarcer, um, we can charge more. So a little economic history here for you. All right, so they control production amounts by controlling membership. The other thing is they're going to control uh, quality, right? They want their town to be known as the place to get dyed wool or to get silver goods. Um, and they want people from all over Europe to come there because it's such high quality, because that's good for the group, right? Guilds are all about what's good for every member of the group. Um, as a group. It's not about capitalism. That hasn't been invented yet. It's not about making profit for yourself and driving your competitors out of business. No, this is a cooperative. We're all going to share in the profits together, right? What I mean by that is, you know, if you make something, I'm not going to get a part of the profit, but we're all going to make sure that we have high prices by controlling production, and we're all going to make sure that we have high quality to attract customers. And so we all own our own shops independently, but we've agreed together on these things to benefit all of us, right? They're also going to control prices. We don't want other people, we don't want guild members undercutting their fellow guild members. You know, if, if, if somebody in our guild is going to charge like half of the price for our dyed cloth, then we're all going to have to compete and we're all going to have to lower our prices too. No, 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 no. We don't want that. We all want to set prices together. We want them high so we all make as much money as possible. Now, we've seen this in other places. In India, we talked about Jati, which are guilds in India, and they have very similar 
um, functions that they provide. The only thing we talked about in India is that the Jati also provided social, kind of a social safety net. And that's what guilds do here as well in Europe. If a guild member falls on hard times, and let's say he dies or gets injured, and he can't provide for his family and for his journeyman and his apprentices, well then the rest of the guild members will pitch in so that his, so that his wife or widow or his children or his journeyman and apprentices won't go hungry and won't be thrown out in the street. And this is providing this kind of social safety net that governments do today in the world, right? They have, um, I don't know, welfare or Medicaid or Medicare or some kind of social safety net in Europe. Um, but there was no really central government at this time in Europe to do this, and so the guild leaps in and fulfills this function. Um, and so it, it provides a lot of support for people within the guild. So as you can imagine, it was a big deal in your life if you were a young apprentice to eventually become a master and become a guild because then your future is set. You know you're going to have customers. You know you're going to have money. Um, you know that you're going to have a, a good quality of life. All right. Next. Now, as these guilds become more and more powerful, as we see more and more trade and more merchants, there becomes a need for education. Because if you're going to be a businessman and you're going to run your business or you're going to be a merchant or an artisan, you have to keep track of, well, who has paid for their goods? Who hasn't? Um, you have to give people receipts. You have to look and have records of what you have on stock. What kind of ingredients do you need? All of those things. So you have to be educated. You have to be literate. But as you remember, we have said before the Crusades, really the only literate people were the clergy, were the church officials, because they could read and write um, the Bible. But nobody else was, because you know Christianity, Catholicism said you didn't need to be. Um, and so we have this incredible need after the Crusades for learning in Europe, especially in cities where we have all these artisans and merchants. And at first, like I said, the only people that could read and write were church officials. So the first schools, the first colleges and universities in Europe were run by the church. Uh, they were run at monasteries um, or local parish priests or something like that. Um, and so the curriculum at first was reading the Bible. Um, and so here we see in this picture, we have some learned priest, and he is teaching his pupils how to read, right? And, and so, okay, they're learning how to read. And then what he has, he has the only book, because Europe does not have the printing press yet, like China does. They have block printing. Europe has not done that. And so everything has to be, every new book has to be done by hand. And so what this guy does is once his pupils have learned to read the Bible, then he starts to look around in the basement. He's like, well, what else can we teach these people? And so we had said some monasteries had preserved Greco-Roman, Greek and Roman um, learning, art, science, math, philosophy. And so he digs out maybe a copy of some Aristotle thing. And he says, well, let's learn about the Aristotle. And so his students... He reads his book that he has to his students, and then the students take notes. They make their own copy of Aristotle's work. And this is how knowledge got transferred. This is you know, lecture that what I'm doing right now is a medieval teaching method, aren't I old, right? Um, and so I read the book that I have, and then you copy and make your own book. And this is how knowledge spreads. And just like you know, some students today, they pay attention. Other students take a nap. Other students are gossiping in the back of the room, right? Um, but this is how people learned. And so Europeans are starting to not just learn about Christianity again, right? I mean, they've always learned about it, but they're reading it for themselves now. But they're also learning about these long lost works of um, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, these Greek and Roman, um, Cicero, these Greek and Roman um, philosophers and mathematicians, Ptolemy, right? Um, and so that's one way they're learning about these things. Now, in addition to that, I've told you that, um, the, that um, you know, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, um, Cicero, all of these Greek and Roman ideas and math and art and science and philosophy, they were preserved by the church, but they were also preserved by the Byzantine Empire, which is just a continuation of the Roman Empire, so it makes sense they would know about Greek and Roman ideas, right? Also, Muslims knew about these ideas because they had traded with the Byzantine Empire, and also, Spanish people had known about it because at this point, most of Spain is controlled by Muslims who have already, with their interactions and with their increased trade that they had, had already learned about these um, Greek and Roman ideas. And so when Europe starts to emerge, 
emerge from the Middle Ages, from the post-classical period. They're learning about their own past from three places, right? They're learning about it from Muslims, who they've interacted with because of the Crusades, the Byzantines, who they've interacted with because of the Fourth Crusade, and then also um, their own little monasteries that you might see scattered throughout Europe um, because the church had preserved some of these things in the literate monasteries of the time. And so we're going to see Europe is starting to learn about their past. Now, at the very end of this time period, period one in the 1400s, and at the very beginning of the next time period, period two, um, in around the 5th, 1450-1500, Europe is going to go through what is called a renaissance, which means a rebirth, a relearning of their past. And this is all coming about because of this trade and this desire for literature and learning and you know digging out some of those long-forgotten um, Greek and Roman ideas or learning about them again from the Byzantines or the Islamic world. All right. So not all that glitters is gold and not all that comes on the Silk Roads is good. Um, and so we're going to see that also on the Silk Roads, and we've talked about this in our last lecture on the Mongols, um, we see that on the Silk Roads comes the plague. Right, um, And so the plague originates probably in China, and it's going to make its way across these oasis trading towns on the Silk Roads. Um, and again, the Silk Road roads go all over the place. Um, and so some of the Silk Roads go down here near India. And so India is going to be impacted by the plague after China is. Central Asia is going to be impacted by the plague. And as, these, as the plague moves on the Silk Roads, the Islamic world is going to be impacted by the plague. And then eventually, through Mediterranean trade in Italy because that's what, who's contacting Europe, right? And the Byzantine Empire, we're going to see that Europe is eventually going to get the plague as well, right? And so the Black Death is going to reach Europe on these trade routes. Now look at this map. It shows you over time, and so it shows you from early to later, right? Um, and so we see that the Black Death in Europe is going to first touch Southern Europe, and then go a little bit further north, and a little bit further north, and a little bit further north. And that's just following the trade routes in Europe, right? The Italian city-states are connected to Asia via Mediterranean trade. And so on some of these boats, when they dock in an Islamic port, um, rats get on the boat, or maybe they in contact with a Muslim merchant who has the plague, and they unwittingly take it back to southern Europe, the Italian city-states. Um, and then the Italian city-states trade with the Hanseatic League, who trades with people further north. And so we see the plague moving from south to north throughout Europe, just absolutely desolating the population, right? Decimating it. Um, and so we see in Europe itself, um, not only are the Italian city-states getting it, but where it goes north, it attacks the cities of the towns and cities of Europe, of Europe first, because that's where the markets are. Um, and so we see the, the urban population is really heavily affected in Europe. And so that is going to have a big impact because manoralism is going to be destabilized. People on manors who were kind of isolated, they did get the plague, but not as much as the people in the cities who are more densely packed on the trade routes. And so once the plague is kind of swept through a city, right, and they've, they've started to recover from it, there's going to be lots of dead people in the city. And so these cities put out these big, if you want to think of it as help wanted signs, or, oh my goodness, we need workers in the cities. And so people will flee from the manor illegally, because serfs are not supposed to leave the manor. And so people at the bottom of the feudal pyramid, all those serfs, a lot of them are going to run away to the cities, because in the city, they might be able to become an apprentice or a journeyman, right? Um, there's higher pay in the cities, there's more opportunity in the cities. So the bottom of the feudal pyramid starts to weaken because a lot of their workers are leaving to go to the cities. Now, obviously they're not going to cities while the plague is rampaging the city, but when the plague kind of subsides, then we see people start to rush into the city. And then a new wave of plague will happen, the cities will be impacted, and then it'll go away, and so another group of people will leave the manors and come into the cities because the plague kind of comes in waves um, every few years. All right, and so we see manoralism start to weaken as a result of the plague. Next, feudalism starts to weaken because the whole base of the feudal pyramid, right? Who is providing the food for the and the and the taxes for the king and the dukes 
and the knights, right? That's at the bottom here. And if you take the bottom out of anything, the whole thing is going to come crashing down. And so we're going to see as we reach the end of this time period, 1450s, we're going to see that manoralism is really starting to weaken. That means feudalism is really starting to weaken. And so what makes the Middle Ages or post-classical Europe or medieval Europe, however you want to call it, all the same thing, what makes it that time period is starting to go away. And so that's why we're starting to enter period two soon after 1450, a brand new time period where Europe is starting to change rapidly. All right, and the Catholic Church's authority is starting to weaken as well. And we have said that in the medieval period or the post-classical period, the Catholic Church was super powerful. They had most of the land of Europe more than anybody else. Um, and they could, you know, excommunicate kings and put the crowns on kings. And so the Catholic Church was it, man. They were the power force in Europe at this time. And they're now, and so now they're starting to have their power weaken because as the Black Plague sweeps through Europe, people look to their religious leaders to make it go away and to give an explanation of why this is happening. Um, has God forsaken us? And so we see that the Catholic priests will like, well, we don't really know why. Or God is mad at you. Well, why is God mad at you? Uh, and they start to make up ideas, right? Um, but people start to, when the plague doesn't go away, and we try to appease the church and God, and it still persists, we start to lose faith. We start to lose faith that the Catholic Church either is legitimate or that they can really understand the will of God, or maybe we even start to doubt God. And so we see that the power of the Catholic Church, its control over its members' beliefs, starts to weaken. In addition to that, the Catholic Church, a lot of the parish priests, they're supposed to give you last rites when you're about to die so that you don't go to hell. But a lot of the priests were like, I'm not doing that because these people are dying of the plague, as we see in this bottom left-hand picture. Um, and so they didn't give last rites. And so that made us really resent and be angry at the church. Um, and so we see that the Catholic Church is starting to lose some of its power. Um, and so the three big things that make the medieval period or the post-classical period, however you want to call it, that time period, manoralism, feudalism, and the Catholic Church's power, they're all starting to weaken as a result of this, this plague that sweeps through Europe. And so this time period is going to come to an end. All right. Um, next, we see pogroms. So we had talked about in our previous lecture that Jewish people are in the minority in Europe at this time, and they live in diasporic communities. They live in, in small, self-contained communities where they have some safety living with other Jews, um, plus um, other Christians don't like them because they're not Christian and they suspect them. And so when the plague happens, people are looking for somebody to blame because they can't make it go away. So they need a scapegoat. And so what they do is they notice that Jews are not dying at, at near the rate of Christians because of this black death. Um, and so they think, well, the Jews must have started it or the Jews must be to blame for it because they're not dying as much as we are. Well, the reason they weren't dying as much is because the Jews, in their religion, they have to wash and be clean um, before they eat a meal. Um, and so what we see is that they just didn't have as much fleas. They weren't, they weren't in living as in as much filth as other people. And so the Black Death just didn't affect them as much. Um, because remember, the Black Death is transported mostly by fleas. Um, and by, you know, um, people packed in, leaving unclean lives. Um, and so, you know, they weren't as effect affected as much. And so people are going to lash out at them. Another reason is that in Christian Europe, the Bible says for Christians that it is illegal to loan somebody money and then charge interest. It's called usury. Um, and so uh, you couldn't be a moneylender in Europe um, if you were a Christian. It was frowned upon by the church. And so since Jews are not part of the Christian community, um, this, is a, this is a service they can fulfill. And so Jews could make money in this Christian Europe by lending money to Christians um, because they were allowed to in their faith and Christianity said Christians couldn't. And so when the Black Plague hits and you're looking for somebody to blame, well, we already talked about why they will attack Jews, and this is an added benefit for those Christians. If I attack this Jewish guy who, first of all, isn't Christian, so it's okay to kill him, and also, um, he, I owe him money. And if I kill him, then I don't owe him money, and maybe I can steal his money. Um, and so we see that there were economic reasons as well as cultural reasons for people to be anti-Semitic. Um, and so we see this ruthless, horrible pogroms where mobs of Christians are attacking Jewish quarters, Jewish diaspora communities. Um, and so this is an, also an aspect, a result of the plague. 
So let's look at the learning objectives. And so number seven, describe the Christian Crusades. So we said there are four of them, and we said they were originally called to go try to retake back some of the places in the Christian Bible and make them put in Christian hands instead of Muslim hands. And we said the only one that was successful was the first crusade, and all the others either fail miserably or they don't like the fourth crusade, they don't even get to Europe. Um, they uh, just stop in the Byzantine Empire and sack that, their fellow Christians. And it says, analyze their impact on Europe. And we said that the Crusades reconnect Europe to Asia. Um, the, before the Crusades, Europe is kind of isolated, feudal, um, not trading very much, constant conflict with each other, and so they're too busy fighting each other to worry about the outside world. Um, but then after the Crusades, we learn about all these new goods, we learn about all these new crops, um, and so Europe starts to reemerge and their population starts to go up. Number eight, analyze the impact of trade on urban areas. We had said that we're going to see urbanization as a result of this because there's a desire for Asian goods, and so people want to buy them, and you're going to buy them in markets and cities, so urbanization goes up. And we said, describe how they challenge the feudal pyramid. Um, and as these cities became more and more wealthy, they got they left the feudal pyramid and they became independent entities called charters. And eventually, if they got powerful enough, they could be completely autonomous and they could become city-states. Number nine, describe the labor system in towns. We had said that the labor system in towns is artisans, and we talked about how one becomes an artisan, the apprentice, journeyman, master craftsman approach. Um, and we also talked about the importance of guilds um, and how they control production and membership and prices. And then we say compared to serfdom in the, in the, in the um, countryside. Well, in the countryside, we said we had two labor systems. We had serfdom, which is where people don't own anything, and they work for people more powerful than them. We have peasant labor, where you control your own land, but it's very small, right? And labor systems of other regions. And we compared guilds um, to jati in India, these, this, these guilds that control production, prices, and membership. Number 10, to what extent did long-distance trade benefit Europe agriculturally? And we said it benefited them tremendously. We said that Europe is going to, as a result of contacting um, the Muslim world, because of the Crusades, they're going to be impacted to all kinds of new crops, which is going to mean that we have a more varied diet and we can grow things in areas that we couldn't grow before, like a more hardy version of wheat, alfalfa, um, and oranges, citrus fruit. And then finally, how did the plague, a pathogen, enter Europe? We said it entered by Mediterranean trade routes. Um, and what impact did it have on society? And we said that the plague is really going to attack all three of the major components of what makes the medieval period or the post-classical period unique, right? We're going to, we said that it impacted, um, it, as the plague comes in, it's going to wipe out cities and so there's going to be job opportunities in cities, and so people are going to leave the manors. Um, and so that's weakening mineralism. The labor system is disappearing, and they're going to the cities. And if mineralism starts to weaken at the bottom, that collapses the whole feudal pyramid. And so we said it's also going to weaken feudalism. And then we also said it's going to weaken that final pillar of the medieval period, the Catholic Church. People are going to start to lose faith in Catholicism because they can't fix this plague problem. And that ends part three and the final part of our lecture on post-classical or medieval Europe.